Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am delighted to be joined by Jim Simonetti and Kevin Graham. Welcome to the show guys. Yep, thank you. Thank you Paul. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to be here in a State of Mind studios uh, to discuss all things Celtic. Obviously yesterday we had numerous broadcasts, Kevin, uh, all around the victory against Motherwell. You've had 24 hours to think about it. How would you view that victory yesterday? Oh, I'm still, I'm, I'm happy with it. It's like I ate his Sundays, give me a happy Monday. So, oh, uh, so you've been thinking about happy that. Mondays, I've been thinking yeah. about that. Aye. Aye. Um, I'm not going to take credit for it, but whoever came up with it on Twitter can take credit for it. But I'll steal it anyway. Um, aye, we done what needed to be done. The setting half was very heartening. Uh, we looked more fluid. We looked more ourselves in the setting half mm-hmm. it was extremely good to see Ayeti getting a goal it was fantastic to see big Julien charging up the park in, in the 92nd minute and he's, he's finished I don't we never really spoke about this yesterday but his finish was a great finish as well excellent and uh, James Forrest Callum McGregor the leadership Forrest's goal look after the week that we had um, we needed three points and we got it, and we had not a bad performance in the second half. Obviously, we've still got an awful lot of questions mm-hmm. um, about the, the fitness of the, the, the players and uh, Neil Lennon's starting team selection, and obviously the European hangover is going to take a wee while to uh, get, get, get over now. But we've got a two-week international break, time to dust ourselves down, have a, re- a wee review of what's going on, uh, Hopefully, maybe get a couple of players in, in the next week or so and then get ready to face Ross County in, on the 12th of September. There's plenty covered there in your uh, opening salvo, Kevin, and I'm sure we'll discuss most of that. Uh, welcome everybody who's tuning in via Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. If you are on YouTube, get subscribing on there. It's free charge and we put out our daily bulletins. We also cover every match day and we have special interview guests coming in uh, on a regular basis. That's not something a Celtic State of Mind will stop doing. But um, we've had plenty to discuss since yesterday, uh, Jim. Obviously, yeah. you were on the panel for the match day. Yep. And you were flying the flag for Neil Lennon, as a lot of people have been doing online. Do you think he was vindicated in his starting lineup yesterday? Flying the flag for the Celtic manager, Paul. Always, always uh, support the manager. So I'm flying the flag for the Celtic manager and, and Neil Lennon. He got it right. He he got the three points. And that was the most important thing he, from yesterday. That he he set his stall out. He, he made a decision. That's how he wanted to do it. He done it. Came off for him. And the second half, he changed the, the formation to what everybody's been asking for, or more or less everybody. They went into a 3-5-2 uh, attacking formation with the two strikers up, up front, which worked, taking players away, leaving gaps, as we said, uh, for support coming from the midfield. But uh, we got the three points and, and good goals as well. So I, I'm, I'm delighted for Neil Lennon, delighted for the Celtic uh, support. But uh, we've got a long... We've got a long haul in front of us, haven't we? We do. I'm looking at the game, and this isn't a, a way of me criticising Neil Lennon. I think it certainly did change when we changed that wee bit and brought on a striker, at least. But again, I'm not criticising Neil Lennon because we got the right result. I thought the first half was a wee bit kind of flat again. Uh, two individual bits of brilliance by McGregor and Forrest yeah. for the goal. He changed it, and we had a lot more kind of energy when... Klamala came on. I'd like to say at this point, I think I was pretty critical of Klamala yesterday, Kevin. Uh, probably the big thing for me is I've been frustrated by the fact that we haven't played a striker. He's come on, and I still believe he had two good chances. I know, Kevin, that you were standing up for him on the first one. And I was critical, and I think I was a wee bit harsh. I was maybe a wee bit hasty in being so critical. I've watched the game back. I've been looking at other comments online. And I think maybe we do have something to work with. With Klamala, what was your view on him coming on at half time, Kevin? I thought he done well when I says this yesterday post match when I sort of defended him when you says that when I mean, you did actually say that you reckon that he didn't have the attributes to be a Celtic striker. I was I was impressed with his movement. I've always been impressed with his touch, how he looks on the ball as well. He looks comfortable on the ball. Um, 
he made a nuisance of himself yesterday against the Motherwell back line when mm. they really, for me, they had an easy time of it in the first 40-odd minutes uh, yesterday. And Lennon was quick to point that out himself after the game, that he thought we were extremely flat in the first half. Again, that could be down to the European hangover. Strikers are going to be judged on goals and it's very easy to judge Kamala on the two chances that he's had. Mm-hmm. I say as the first one, the keeper gets that nick of the ball, which means he can't adjust his feet. I reckon the second one, he tried to be too smart. He tried to give the keeper the eyes and he tried to put it in the opposite corner and it didn't work. The keeper read it. Again, the shot wasn't too great because I still think it was too close to the goalkeeper. Mm -hmm. But is that a striker that's short of confidence? Because he never got a game on Wednesday night. Because, because the managers went with a creative midfielder or a false nine, if we want if we want to use technical terms, rather than going for an out and out striker. After Kamala has actually been praised in the summer about the way that he's come back, yeah. All of a sudden, he wasn't ready. After getting praised and he playing him in pre season, scored a few goals in the pre season games. He came on against Hamilton and scored a great goal as well. So. The, la- the, the lad is maybe a bit confused about where he actually stands now. Yeah. But for me, the 45 minutes that he gave us yesterday shows that we've definitely got something to work with. Mm. We've got a guy who knows his job, can make a nuisance of himself. And if Lee Griffiths, and we spoke at length about Lee Griffiths yesterday, if Lee Griffiths is not going to be available, then I reckon Kamala is a good third choice striker. Good third choice, so I was wrong. I'm not saying that you were wrong. You might I be know, proved I'm right. I'm saying that. I'm saying uh, that. I think I probably was a bit harsh and a bit hasty on no, no, a guy know. who's he's, he's still he's still quite young, isn't he? As well. Uh, so I don't think you were. So Eduard uh, and Yeti. The big question we asked after the game, Kevin, was: Is that you know is that the dream partnership? Is a Yeti going to be partnering Eduard? And I guess when we're looking at the the news that Shane Duffy's coming in, we're asking the question: Will that be the catalyst, maybe for a change? Information and there's loads of great comments coming in via Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, and we'll get round to as many as possible. I, I still have this view, particularly like games like yesterday, like against Hamilton at home, and against Ferenc Varos even at home and and Reykjavik, that you play with three at the back. I think Celtic are effective playing with three at back with the, with the two wing backs, if you like to call them that, um, be that Frimpong, Forrest, El Yunusi. Um, whoever else you decide to play out the left, you might have something to say about that later, Jim. Yeah. Uh, with two up front, with two up front, and people might think that's old fashioned. Well, you know, I don't think it's as effective when Edward's up there on his own. A jetty looks like the type that might be a good partner for him. So, what I think I'm asking is Shane Duffy coming in, uh, that's going to shore up the defence, but does it give us a, that, that added option of having the three centre halves and Duffy being that experienced guy, Jim? Who might be able to shore up the defence? Oh, it, it gives you the option there, a uh, uh, showing it up. It gives you the added confidence that you've got a, a player in there who has got more more knowledge uh, in his bag by playing than in the Eng- English uh, uh, Premiership. So he's got all that experience that he's going to bring up here. And it will help the two players run about them if we go with the three. Mm. Indeed, if we do go with the three, which I would like to see. So that helps us at the back, going for the three five two. The midfield, where, with the new player that's been brought in, where are we going to play him? That was brought up yesterday. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I'm looking at that, and a lot of people were saying yesterday probably Encham could drop out. Kevin, what's your thoughts? I, I'm a big fan of Encham. At th- this present time, Turnbull needs to work his way into that side for me. Definitely, but I'm going to stick with what I said yesterday, that I can see Turn- Turnbull playing either an 8 or a 10, and he is going to get games in that position because of the number of games that we play. Mm-hmm. There, there, there is going to be injuries, there is going to be suspensions. So it's not maybe a case of working his way into the team, it's a case of waiting until he gets the chance to go into the team. At the moment, for me, I, I don't think N. Cham's done enough to stay in the team. Right. I, do, I don't think he's been... When Neil spoke about guys with their minds elsewhere... I think it was aimed at directly at Encham. Do you think he's played like that though, Kevin? Because, you know, I actually thought Encham played well against Ferenc Varos. I know that Neil Lennon has stated that he thought the team played well, despite the, the result. 
I don't think in Cham's playing like a guy who's not interested. The, he's maybe not contributing for we for I expected him to be. Maybe he's not involved in the game as much as what I expected him to be. I mean, you look at the game, we'll go back to the game against Reykjavik when he came on in the second half. Mm -hmm. He completely dominated the game. Completely bossed that game. And maybe I've just had the notion that he was going to do that against Dundee United. That he was going to do that against Ferrad Varos. That he was going to do that against Motherwell. And my maybe unre unrealistic expectations of what I expect for Oliver and Cham because of his talent, I'm maybe doing him an injustice. I'm, I'm not noticing that he's having a good game because I've got such, such high expectations for him. Do you think he's one of the best players in the Celtic team? Uh, yes, and I also do think he's one of the best. He's the best midfield player in Scotland on his day. On his day? On his day. See, when we come up against the, the defence of, let's say, Kilmarnock, which you're looking at a player, a so-called creative player to to you know, find a, a breach in a defence like that, or you're coming up against Dundee United, who, yeah. for me, played a very rigid back line as well, Kevin. Um, I think for a player like Cham, sometimes when you're looking at um, the overall performance, because he's viewed to be a creative player, that you know he, he comes in for flack because he's not been able to find a way through. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he's particularly played all that badly. I mean, there was a moment in the game yesterday against Motherwell where... He the passage of play and the forward pass that he made, he's the only player on the pitch who was capable of doing it. You know, so that's all it takes to turn a game. And I think in Cham, you've got a player there. If we were, op uh, you know, trying to buy him in the open market right now, if he was playing these performances, maybe in the French league or or down south, we would be struggling because his transfer fee would be so high. I, I think it would be a mistake to face him out. I possibly, but uh, if you've got somebody in the team that can just pull that wee bit of magic out at any given point. Yeah. And that leads to something really special. You're delighted. You're delighted that you've got... You're, you're talking about that pass that he made yesterday. It was a good pass. It was very good. But in a game, in a game, if you pull that out more than once, twice, three times over, you become something a wee bit special. And you can, del can have that trick in your book. You look at, let's go back to the left back. Sorry, let's go to the left back. I made a mistake yesterday. We, we actually seen Turnbull eh, going to the left back. I didn't mean it. What I meant was was Taylor. Yes. He going to the back. I think you corrected me, Paul. You you look at the young boy Taylor just now. What What has he got that he could pull out and do something a wee bit special at this particular time? He's no got what cham has got, has he? I don't think he's quite at that level. I think he's no. In, in, in terms of creativity, he does have a killer pass. Turnbull. I do think he, he does have that. Uh, Turnbull does. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I'm talking about Taylor. Oh, Taylor. Taylor. I think Taylor is probably at a stage where he's seen more of the ball than he's ever seen in his yeah. professional career. And, you know, I mean, every time you see him, you think to yourself, you need to get the cross in. He's not getting the distribution right for me. No. You know, in, a, in an offensive uh, manner. And the, re the reason I, I go back for, for Cham to him is coming down that left flank when we had a uh, Tierney, he done some some things a wee bit special when he got the he got uh, he got that ball across, didn't he? And he made them count. At the moment, young Taylor hasn't been able to do that. No. He's not got that special special bit in his bag at the moment to give us that killing cross or that killing pr pass that's going to have that um, bit of impact. That's needed in the game. So Cham, Cham, is he the only player in there that we're looking at that's maybe got the something wee bit special to come out? I don't think so. I think Christy. I think Christy. Uh, on his day, El Yunusi. It's unfortunate that this season he's been a wee bit in inconsistent. Mm. I would suggest El Yunusi because I mean, even yesterday, after playing quite well the other night. You know, he was almost Aye. anonymous mm -hmm. yesterday. And going back to what you said about Ferenc Varos, you were expecting maybe a better performance from Encham. If you watched the goal leading up to Christie getting the ball, that was all Encham. You know, so he did have an impact in the game. I just think, you know, the actual result, you, you, you tend to view it a wee bit differently, don't you? Because it was such a disappointing result. But Encham, you know, I, I look at Roger, he's only 27, Roger. Aye. He's on his way out. It's the longest departure ever. The long goodbye, I think you could call it, right? He's still in your cupboard waiting for Shane Duffy and mm -hmm. Tommy Roger's not out the building yet. And, 
you know, I, I, as much as I loved everything that Tommy Roderick did for Celtic and the amazing moments that he gave us, yeah. I would be far, far more unhappy if Encham was leaving than Tommy Roderick. Yeah, absolutely. I think Encham's got a lot to offer us. He's still, he's still got a lot to offer, hasn't he? He definitely does. But you mentioned Turnbull, so let's talk about him because we've not had a massive amount to say about David Turnbull. He, you know, he was announced the day after the the uh, disappointment of going out of the Champions League. We've come up against Motherwell and he's not featured. He's been on the bench. I don't think he walks into the team. Very, very rarely should any player walk straight into the team, Jim. But where do you see him uh, maybe breaking through? Where do I see him? Well, at the moment, I don't see him uh, going into he, he, the midfield role. But... But could it? Could he? Could he slip in um, uh, the back? Could he slip in at the back there to do a job in the meantime? Would you have? Would you have more confidence uh, in Turnbull slipping in there rather than Taylor? No, you wouldn't. No. Right? Okay. So, where are you going to play him in midfield? I've already said, Jim, that, that I do reckon that he will get opportunities because of the number of games that we play and because he doesn't need to adjust to the Scottish game. Mm-hmm. I, st- I think they're really harsh on Greg Taylor. I do understand his limitations, but when you look back at the game against Hamilton, I think he had three assists mm-hmm. that game. Mm-hmm. His distribution in his final ball has got to be better. But we can say that about the whole Celtic team over the last three games. Well, the first half yesterday against Ferravarosh, against uh, Dundee United, we can say that our final ball has got to be better all over the pitch with everybody. With me, with, with David Turnbull, we've signed him as an energetic, creative midfielder who can play the two positions, who can play an 8 and a 10. Neil Lennon's chased us, the, the player for a year yeah. after a serious injury. Mm-hmm. He is going to get game time. He's definitely going to get game time because Neil Lennon has been desperate to get him at the club and there's no set on in period for him. So, But at left back, that's a Stephen Pearson case, ain't it? Don't think so. Don't think so. If you if you look at him, you get him on and he's such a, an attacking player, do you not think if he was in a four four two formation, he could be an attacking fullback? I just, I just think you're taking something, you're, you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole there. Mm. I, I do think he's a centre midfielder. He can play two positions extremely well in the centre of the midfield and it's try and convert him to a left back. It's just, I'm not saying convert him. But I'm play, him play him a, 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 as a left-sided midfielder yeah. is, is folly. So who do you take out then? But put him in. So if you had your choice just now, right, an elevator question to you. Who would you put? Who would you take out to put him in if he's got the opportunity to play tonight? See, when you ask elevator questions, we should have a wee bit of elevator music. Absolutely. In on the old Can days. you get them in? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. I'd quite like that. So, what do you think? Who Who would you take out? Who would I take out? Yeah, put him in. If going be where I see him getting games, he will replace Scott Brown. In a couple of games, he'll replace Ryan Christie mm-hmm. and he could replace Callum McGregor as well if any one of those three need a rest. Mm-hmm. He, but he can step into any one of those three positions. Any one of the three. So he's ba- he's basically playing back up until such times as he's um, he's earned his place and he's starting line up. And I think when you look at uh, the performance actually yesterday off McGregor, it was the best game he's played all season, Kevin. Paul, one of our guests, Paul Kelly, yesterday suggested, you know, sometimes that's good. That's good actually for existing players. We go back to when uh, Paddy Roberts signed and James E. Forrest played yeah. some fantastic stuff. Even though um, it's been pointed out more than once that Forrest has done more than okay over the last couple of seasons where there's been nobody breathing down his neck. But um, Turnbull, yeah, it's all about uh, him pushing for a first team place. I mentioned Tommy Rogic. I think the long goodbye will definitely come at some point. Not sure when, Kevin. What's your give me give me your finest moment that uh, Tommy Rogic gave us in a Celtic jersey? It's got to be the obvious one. Eh? It's got to is be it the obvious. One. It it's one of a few. It's one of a few. I'll, I'll go to another one. Um, Kilmarnock under Ronnie Dyler mm. when he hit that wonder shot. Yeah, I flew down about f- four rows of seats because. Even though we probably wouldn't, wouldn't have lost the league to Aberdeen that year, I think if we hadn't won that day, it was going down to four uh, points. Uh. And so, 
to get that victory to keep it at the, I think it was six or seven. Um, what a strike. The game I was, changer. I, I was right behind it and as soon as it left his foot, I mean, it's magic. I mean, I don't know if any of the, the viewers have actually watched the, the programme because he basically won Nike's football idol. Did he? A futsal player. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it is on YouTube. That's brilliant. And, and you is that when he was a, he was a futsal a teenager, player? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. He was a futsal player. He was he was a six aside player, and he was only he had only played eleven eleven aside football for three seasons when Celtic signed him. So that's how you can see the close control on his feet. In he, that he was he was a good servant, wasn't he? Mm. Uh, seven years, Jim. Seven he, years. He it's no fantastic. Ah. It's great. I, I used to like he, he, Roger, and I, I liked him coming off the bench as well. The goal at, he, against Rangers was a magnificent goal Aye. as well with that left left mm-hmm. peg. It was absolutely brilliant. You heard it hitting the net. Ah, it you know, like... the only thing he missing that day was the was the rain. When you see the ball hitting the back of the net and the rain just trickling. You're an old romantic. You're an old romantic. There's brilliant. a fam- there's brilliant. A fa- there is a famous one: Charlie Mulgrew and Neil Lennon's <laughs> first <laughs> Scottish Cup final when he hits the free kick <laughs> and you see the rain. Oh, the Motherwell game. Oh, the Motherwell. You oh. see the rain. Who scored the one goal that day for Motherwell? Were we at that game? Again? No, that was, a, no, that was no, another that, one. That, that was the other one. Kagan. I'm sure Kagan scored an OG, an OG that day. That would have been nice. What, what's good about players like that as well, uh, over, the, over the years now, they're all part of the history and they'll become part, uh, part of a folklore for a talk in, mm. in years to come. But and it's brilliant. I think he's, he's been brilliant. He's been great for us. See, he's the type of player with the skill and the creativity and the individuality that he was born to play for Celtic. Yeah, he, 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 Celtic he, he, player. He, he, he yeah, great, he, he, I get that. The hoops fitted him well. Essential, absolutely. We'll go to some of the comments being made on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, we've got a, a loyal band of followers, which are you know it's brilliant because you're tuning band, in. Faithful band, faithful. faithful band of followers, and you're tuning in on social media to to get involved. Gary Doonan, welcome back, Gary. Yeah. It's about time you came into the studio and, and was on the show and in person. It will be a catalyst for different formations for certain games. Yep. I agree with that 100% because I don't think you can be too rigid in this modern day, Jim, where you've got to be able to look at a game and change it. You know, even 40 minutes into a game, change it if it's not working. You know, second half of a game, change the formation. If you can't get that breakthrough, you've got to be able to change it. Uh-huh. And we've almost got the personnel to do that. Uh, of course. And he's right. You can't, but that's how I was throwing that wee uh, grenade in here there uh, about Turnbull. Tommy Burns. Tommy Burns said to me, to me uh, he says, Jim, what's the, what's the position you played when young? He says, left, left back, left, say left or uh, right. But where do you play? I said, that's, that's where I play, Tommy. He says, where would you play? For me, I said, anywhere. He said, that's what I want you to say. He said, see, going forward, see if you can take that, that wee saying, and say, I'll play anywhere. He says, where would you play for Celtic? I said, anywhere. Anywhere. He said, and that's what I try to install. So any of his old players, if they're listening and comment, commenting, Tommy Burns, players would play anywhere for him. Mm-hmm. Tommy left mid drop to left back are you am I right you should be able to play anywhere see as a professional footballer you should be able to play in that part yes there's, when they become a, a, a wee bit a, a, a season's pros and, and starting off we'll get strikers we'll get midfielders we'll get defenders but I believe that Neil Lennon put McGregor back to left back Last year, didn't he? Against Cluj, uh-huh. Against Cluj. Didn't he work? Didn't he work right, did it? No. But it could have worked, but it didn't he? So, it, but he still went in there and played the game. Mm-hmm. And all I'm saying is, with yourself there, it's, it's a possibility to be able to use, and Gary's right, the rigidness can be moved about. You don't need that rigidness. You can adapt your team accordingly. Yeah. It's a, so, I mean, the point you made with McGregor. Yeah. I remember a couple of occasions... But it actually did work. Remember the cup final when Tierney broke his jaw? Yeah. And, you know, McGregor was the guy that went to left That's back. That's right. It nearly didn't work, though, Paul, because he stood on the ball and Johnny Hayes ran through on goal. I remember that. Yeah. That's the best song that's ever been at Celtic Park for a long time. 
Johnny, Johnny Hayes. Great lyrics, isn't it? Johnny, Johnny Hayes. Talkery music, somebody's actually <laughs> pointed out. Francie Dubell, you has pointed out via YouTube that you had you looked oblivious to the Happy Mondays reference that uh, <laughs> Kevin made. Aye, I know. Yeah, fan. Happy Mondays, John. Happy Ryder. Mondays. Yes. Listen, I'm happy Monday, happy Tuesday, happy Wednesday. It is Monday, isn't it? I lose track. I lose track. Ah, yeah. I'm sorry, that's no Imagineer of music. Not to say that it's no good. It's every, every type of music's good uh, for every type of listener. Oh, the Happy Mondays for me. I remember going back. I actually went to Manchester to see them in the 1990s, Kev. Mm-hmm. And, uh, when I was there. You could see, like, in the front, no backstage, but the kind of front side stage was Schmeichel and David Beckham standing watching them. Like, the talk- Manchester Evening News Arena. You were talking about the Happy Mondays. I remember the song, I Don't Like Mondays. That's right, yeah. The Boomtown Rats. Gilbert. I remember when that first came out. Paul, know what I'd like to say? That yesterday's viewers was 20,125. Yeah. That is phenomenal. That, that is. is absolutely brilliant. That is. So the viewers and the listeners are tuning in and it's great. Absolutely brilliant. It is tremendous, Jim. And, you know, it's obviously a lot of that is down to these guys that are tuning in. What's the, the people out there, right? The Bulletin's live and interactive. Yeah. This season, we've started off live and interactive. We're going to keep it going all the way through the season. Yeah. Uh, we have the kind of facility here. At the, at the studio that if something happens up in Sky Sports on the wall there we can actually go live to, to get your views on it Yeah, you know so if there's a breaking story we'll be breaking with, with a bulletin we'll have our daily bulletins on match day mm. stuff and it's just great so thanks everybody for tuning in That that's one of our first kind of targets get up to 20,000 a day and then we can keep pushing it from there uh, Joe Porter welcome back Joe you're commenting via YouTube People being blinded by Duffy, says Joe. Yes, he's a fan, and yes, he has EPL experience, but he had absolutely no pace. Now, see, when you we're looking at a guy who goes into the middle of that defence, and we're looking for him to, I, I described it as shoring up a defence. When you look at Julian and Ayer, you know, it's not the worst partnership in the world, is it? I keep going back to this, Kevin. I know that Lennon had kind of split it up after the Kelly game. I think it's a, a fairly decent uh, partnership that they two guys have got. What what I do feel though is that we're more effective with three at the back, and it would be good to have the experience. So, could you play somebody in there with a lack of pace when you've got somebody like Ayer? Because Ayer has got pace. Julian, Ayer's fast. Julian's quite quick as well. Yeah. He's got he's got a fair stride on him. Hope wait, wait, Duffy. I, I I must admit I haven't seen a lot of Duffy, yet, but I understand what Joe's I understand what Joe's saying there. Hope really. It doesn't worry me, but it intrigues me that every journalist calls him no nonsense. Mm. Does that just make him right away a target for Scottish uh, referees? Well, again, no. Sometimes it's just, you know, people, f- it's lazy to, to say that. It's like when people say, he's a Rolls Royce of a defender. What does that mean? It's lazy, you know. Or he's a cult, he's got a cultured left foot. You never hear anybody with a cultured right foot. So, no, you know, I, I, I don't subscribe to that. I, I mean, really don't. It's just that. We we hear that he's like a uh, Jim probably maybe knows a bit more about him than me. Um, we hear that he's a no nonsense, tough centre back who I does the simple Julian thing. Dix when I hear and that. I'm like, well, uh, do we really want a no nonsense, tough centre back? Are we actually only buying a no nonsense, tough centre backs back because we reckon that you and Canny handle big strikers? Mm-hmm. Just, just to have a, a physical presence for for long enough. You said we need. A big Eastern Bloc defender with a skinhead, and we had one. We had one. Jozo Simunovic, right? We had one, and we've let him leave. Now, I know he was, uh, listen, I'm not saying I regret that. I think we've let him leave, we've let Johnny Hayes leave, and that was the right thing. It's gone, it's gone. But a no nonsense defender, I think we need more than that, especially when we're looking at European performances. We need more than a no nonsense defender, because I just think. A no nonsense defender, somebody that wins a lot of heaters and you know boots the ball up the park. We've got two guys there that like to play football, and Julian De- and I are. And De- you've got to play ugly as well sometimes. Declan Gallagher's a no nonsense I- defender. You go, you got to play ugly. Go to play ugly, and you want him in there as a presence. He is going to be that presence with the stature in there and the balance that he's controlling. He's controlling that and run about him. He's controlling with his experience. He's saying he, he's he's two guys. Listen. We're going over it right. We're going over together. We're going over to the left. We're going over together. We don't want to. We don't want to be too wide 
and we're back three. We want to keep it tight. We want to be talking to the centre mid who's going to drop in when we're defending to make it a four or bring another person in to make it a five. That could be the right mid or it could be the left mid. You've got a guy in there who is going to be a captain at the back. Captain and looking at everything around about him. Help him at the back to make those other players better as well around about him. So the presence part, yes, he might not be the, the, the fastest, but the presence part is very, very important in there. The stability, the stability in there is important and the leadership is important. That's that's a quality. Their qualities in themselves, like speed is. Speed's a quality. Relaxing at the back is a quality. Rel- e- e- relaxing your players round about you is a quality. Being an overall professional round about and reading the game and how it should be read, I think that's what Shane Duffy will bring. He might not bring that extra pace coming through the back. So therefore, his job at the back is there to sit and you're rightfully saying that Julian can come forward Ayer can come they can drop out as well so I would be quite happy with Duffy being in there as a presence and a leader Who was the last player you would describe the last centre half we had Kevin as a no nonsense defender Who is the last centre half we've had that you would describe as a no nonsense Stephen McManus Stephen McManus Mastorovic Mastorovic. Yep. Mastorovic. Yep. Um, Virgil is a no-nonsense centre-half, but not in the common Steve, term of I, a no-nonsense centre-half. I, I would never describe Van Dyke as not a no-nonsense centre-half. No. I just get a vision of somebody who likes to put their t- toe through the ball, um, somebody who's sliding about winning headers. I don't know if that's what Shane Duffy is, no. to be honest. I, don't know I certainly either, wouldn't describe Virgil Van Dyke as that, because he was... That guy was just, you know, you could have played him anywhere. Virgil you van... You could have played him left, back, right, anywhere. wing, anywhere. Anywhere, in that back four. In a back three, back four, back five, a- anywhere. Virgil van Dyke is like Sam Cook. <laughs> smooth, <Yes>. cool, <laughs> operator. Yeah, he's a smooth operator. He's, he's smooth. But he makes the game look slow. He makes it look slow by the way that he picks the ball up. It's like Sam Cooke singing a song. It's so easy, easy done. He puts it out. But Big Van Dyke, he's a Rolls Royce. <laughs> but don't forget, don't forget, he learnt his trade. He helped part of his trade at Celtic that made him the better player. Then he goes up, he goes up, and he's what he's nominated to be one of the best players in the world. Yeah, It's the way that he goes about his business. Look at the way that he organises, Paul. Look at the way that he conducts the orchestra. He's a conductor for the back. He doesn't really break sweat. You don't think he does. But he does. It takes but effort he, to make it look effortless. Absolute, <clears throat> yeah. Absolutely. He he is like water, my friend. He just flows. We've he gone flows. Through. Happy oh, Mondays no. to Sam Cook. To Bruce Lee. Where else? Where else? <laughs> Do you like that? Glasgow Rebel via YouTube. Good afternoon, lads. Thanks for sharing your cold. I caught it today. That was a virtual <laughs> cold on Friday. That's why I was sitting in this room myself. But that's how you, you were still struggling. But I went and I did it. And the and the room's <clears> all been cleansed down as well. Can Paul. I just ask them before you go to another comment, Paul? Did Sam Cook not get shot? Was that going to do anything? Did he not get shot in a No, he, I, he, he got assassinated in Memphis. Did he? Uh, did but, he? That's we'll, another podcast, we'll that's another podcast. Yeah, that's another pod- Shane Man, Duffy will be an amazing player to bring into the squad. There you go. I just, I mean, we've obviously we've spoken to Spencer Vignes, who mm-hmm. is the Brighton and Hove Albion fan. He's written books on the club. He's been on this podcast. And he tells us, Shane Duffy's what you're looking for. He needs a wee bit of love. He needs that at this moment in time. He's kind of been given a cold shoulder down there, isn't he, by the manager. So... I, you know, I'm not knocking him. I just don't like the terminology of a no nonsense because I don't think a no nonsense defender is what we need. I honestly don't think that is what we need. No. And you know, I think what we're looking for. You go back to, let's say, Martin O'Neill's time, the centre halves he had, and he was buying in Valharan, and you right. know, and he was buying in Baldi. Prior to him, Mialbi, who was utilised by O'Neill, but he was bought in by Venglos. Brilliant centre half. Absolutely. You know, S- Stephen made a good point uh, yesterday. And St- Stevie, he he played played at the back. Baldy, Bobo, Bobo's going to get you. That was the cry, wasn't it? It was. That was the cry. 
Bobo Baldi had a presence. He had a presence. I, me and Stevie were talking on the way home yesterday. He said, do you remember, Sammy, a time against Rangers, he was just himself, and he walked to it, and he, had his, he actually had his shirt off. Oh, he was a unit. And he was a unit. So you've got that unit there in front of you, and you know you can play a wee bit as well. You're going, by the way, I maybe don't want to get near him. So we used to pull their socks up above his knees. I know. Uh, made him uh, look even bigger. Aye. Uh, I mean, Omar Colley, that's in the name you mentioned the other day, Kevin, Sampdoria, eight and a half million euros. I guess that deal's dead then if we're looking to bring in Shane Duffy. Well, let's have a wee look at this. If we're bringing in Shane Duffy on loan only, yesterday it looked like it might have been permanent, it might have been four years, but the person who's reported it's a loan deal is usually spot on when it comes to Celtic. Stephen McGowan. Stephen uh, McGowan, yeah. for, for the Daily Mail, he's usually spot on. If we lose a centre-half and I'm probably looking at big higher at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if Omar Coley is an actual goer, as right. well as Shane So you're Duffy. looking at that, yeah, as Iyer Only out, if Iyer leaves. Right, OK. I had a look, um, I, I love looking at Sam Doria's badge, it looks like uh, the Be Sailor badge. You know the one that I'm on about? It looks, yeah. like, it looks like the guy for Gorillas, but it's actually a, a sailor called John Baptiste. Uh-huh. Because Genoa, a port time and that right. Forget about my Italian football. Get back, get back to no. But Italian football, Kevin, going back to the nineties was a big thing, and we all mm-hmm. had a a weekend of interest, if sometimes a passing interest in Italian uh-huh. football. Remember when Channel Four covered it? So that's right. Now fair play. I, I, I text my friend who watches a lot of Italian football, and I says I haven't really seen much of this Omar Colley, mm. and he says to me, he says he's a big lanky guy at the back with a telescopic legs. All right, uh, and as soon as he says that, like, I, 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 know, I know the Bobo. I, I know the player that you're on about. There is there is a YouTube video. If that's your thing, go and watch the YouTube video, and he makes very very good interceptions, and he's decent in there. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a lot of money, and yeah. uh, Sam Doria paid eight million euros for him last summer for Ghent. So if we're going to get him. It's going. We're going to need to spend more, and the the deal has got to be more than eight million euros. Well, the thing, Kevin, that we've been discussing is the change intact when it comes to how we've done our business. And yes, I was critical the other night after the game when I said about the board getting deals over the line because that's their job. It's not Neil Lennon's job to do that part mm-hmm. of it. But we did say that the calibre of player that we've brought in this pre-season and at the beginning of the season has been of a higher calibre. There was a great point online, and I think it might have been Stevie Ray that made it in relation to how Ajax are bringing players in for about 10 million euros and then selling them for 40 and 50 yeah. million euros. And the bit that we've never got right, because we've always cashed in in a big way with your Van Dykes and Wanyamas, etc., is we've never then gone out and bought your 10 million pound player or your eight and a half million pound player. Perhaps that is what we're looking to do in terms of the IR deal. We're maybe, listen, don't shoot the messenger, the, the quoted fees, 27 million, isn't it, from AC Milan. If you get that money in and then you spend the best part of 10 million, so it is a completely different approach, but not one that I would argue with, to be No, fair. absolutely. But you're saying you were critical the other night there. We, we, look, that, that game's in the past. That, that's gone, and you've got to look to the, the, the present and the future now. But just, just to go back on that, uh, we're dragging our heels. So do you think we should have been doing to uh, Mr Bloom and said, there you are, much are you wanting for, uh, for Shane Duffy? There it is. There, there's the figure. Not there's quite. that figure there. We're not going to drag our heels. We want this player just now. Maybe we did drag our heels. Couldn't didn't he, he speak to Mr. Bloom? Maybe we did. But we've got to learn from that, haven't we, Paul? And say, if we want a player and we really want him, we've got to push the ball out that wee bit, bit extra. And it's okay as maybe saying that... Uh, you know what, there's that £12 million pound player, he's sitting on the bench, or there's that £10 million player sitting on the bench. Let's go and get him. Mm-hmm. Then, they sell, then the fans think, he's a £15 million pound player, he's a £10 million pound player. No, he's, no, he's only worth the value you buy him for. So, going forward, the player that we're talking about there, if we want him, let's go and get him, and make him ours, without hesitation. No, I agree with you. I totally agree with that, Jim, because... Gone are the days, and I think Kevin's uh, spoken about this at length, of us picking up 
Juan Yama for 900 grand ah, they're, they're from gone. Belgian football or Van Dijk from the Netherlands for what two and a half million quid at the time I think those days are gone because those markets now the English Premiership and various other leagues are now tapping into these markets including Edward they're tapping into these markets mm-hmm. Aye, including Edward what did we get Edward for? PSG 9 million 9 million 9 million pounds I mean there's always going to be a plethora of players down at these academies down in England Kevin that you know, that's where NCHAMs come from. You know, yeah. uh, Boyata, he, he was, what age was he when we signed him? People forgot 24, how old. 24, 24, played 24, very little football. There's a lot of these guys who are just under the surface down in England and all across the big leagues now. I mean, Bayern Munich are buying up talent. We can see it. They're coming and buying players for, or signing players anyway from, from Celtic. What, what's good is the young guys here, uh, uh, you oh, pointed at Kevin there. Facts, the, 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 the young guys and the other young guys he got on the show, they're fantastic with the stats. They've got all the stats, they've got the knowledge about this, where this player is, where that player is. They've got great, great, great knowledge. But now, the Celtic, the Celtic a, a board have got to come up and say, here, on a worldwide basis, we've got this player at three million, we'll get that player there, or that player there. As we spoke about yesterday, getting the right players to come in. The six hundred thousand pound players, nine hundred thousand pound players, they're going to be, they're going to be harder to get to turn them into twenty million and thirty million pound players now. Oh, definitely. I, I mean, go- there's exceptions. Frimpong, I think, has been a, a real find, a real, a real nugget. In amongst that, you know, uh, when he uh, signed, you thought uh, boy from Man United was going to be the boy that broke through. He's aye. now at Tranmere. Look, O'Connell as well, yep. um, like, was a, who played well in a half in pre season. Um, what, what, Jim? But he's become messy overnight when we're looking for a creative definitely. player, Kevin. That was maybe just Mary David here. You know? <laughs> that anything, but. You know, if you're struggling for creativity, then people are starting to demand that Luke O'Connell's going in. Mm. Neil Lennon watches these guys at training every day, Neil, he'll know. Of course. You know, so um, there's loads of comments coming in. Facebook, and we have a comment. I think 352 is the way forward. Eduard Ayeti up top just needs someone in left wing back to match Frimpong on the right. I wouldn't disagree with that. I don't think we've got that balance quite right yet. Um, and I don't think Frimpong's anywhere near being a first pick because the only way I would maybe pick him from the beginning is if you're dropping El Yanusi and playing Forrest out left and you're playing Frimpong out hey. right. If you're playing, that's where he's effective. Uh, 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 if you just let me jump on, you go on, you go on, carry on. If you play Frank Pong as a right wing back, you've got to be sure that your two sitting midfielders are going to cover, are going to do a defensive job. Yeah, you've got to ensure that's going to happen. But and that, then the question is, is it worth it for what he gives you offensively? And I would say yes. When you see the way that he can, you know, carve open a defence, Kevin. Has Has Brown got the legs? To cover that, no, but it, but it wouldn't be Brown. Brown's already he's already sitting. <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. In the centre mid row, he's sitting in there. So the right mid and the left mid, it, it, it really depends how the game's flowing, and he's coming up where he's going to sit to cover uh, for him in there. But if you look at Fim Pong when he came on yesterday, you would go, "Wow, that's a fantastic performance that you've gave us uh, uh, since you, 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 you're playing here." You, you would have him starting, but could you rely on him? Could you rely on him to be up and back in defence? At this time, I don't think we could. But going forward, going forward, definitely. And when he's up in that final third, taking the kickings, if he's got to take them, and it gains more ground for us to get our free kicks in, to gain a, a, uh, the free kicks going into the, into the box... So I think he'll be good at that because he will get pulled down more and more. And if he gets pulled down, he even run about the eighteen yard box, and he's take. I think he could take it. I think he could become a better player for that as well. So if he's driving down and he's delivering, he's delivering into that box. He's done his job, hasn't he? But I liked Frimpong yesterday. Do you think Frimpong ben- benefited yesterday from having El Hamed on the right-hand side behind him? And, th- he, and he knew El Hamed was there. Was cover- I, I, I think he did. I think he did. I think he did. But what, what I seen yesterday was he was oozing confidence. He was oozing confidence. And it was as if 
the message he's been told to him, go and take them on. Go up there and penetrate in, 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 in their last third of the park and create for us. And that's what I thought. He looked very energetic. He looked, he, he rejuvenated. He, mm-hmm. he looked as if he wanted to play. He looked as if he wanted to impress. And that's what I liked about him yesterday, Paul. A wee bit more of the what you've seen as, a, as his natural ability when he first yes, came absolutely. in. Absolutely. Has been evident um, uh, yesterday. Aye. And during the week when he came on, I think. Definitely. He showed a bit of that. Um, and the question would always be, where do you play him? Because I think defensively suspect, like you say. Aye. Kevin, we've got a few great comments coming in. And um, a certain Stephen Mullen, who was on Stay yesterday. Yep. I hope you're feeling better, Stephen. Before the two clubs sit down, they should know everything involved in the deal through the agent, fee, wages or loan fee. Players decide on the deal. So, I mean, the thing, the thing with Duffy, I think, that I would be concerned that, Kevin, is you, you put him in as this no-nonsense type and you've got two ball-playing um, defenders around about him. But your your suggestion might make sense that perhaps Ayer is, is uh, still someone that we might lose. And if so, you're then going into the market at £8.5 million and you're, you're dipping into Serie A at that stage. Uh, Lawrence Connolly, thanks for getting involved via Facebook. Without a reserve league, Players like Frimpong and Taylor need to be playing first team games to improve defensively. I think it's a great shout. Got a wee visitor behind you there. Uh, for everybody who thinks that's a door, it's actually a window. There you go. It was wearing a Celtic top though. Um, welcome to the show, young man. Well, we'll so, actually get our own personal crash here as well. We do, yeah, we've got a crash if you want to visit. So, without a reserve league, we bang on about this reserve league all the time, Jim. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'm old fashioned. No, you're not. But I go on about the reserve league all yeah. the time. I think we miss it. Ah, uh, definitely. But we've got to, uh, we've got to, we've got to do something with that uh, that league. We've, we've got to get these players playing. And I think we stated before, guys, uh, in a previous show, that Celtics get, get uh, friends out there in various clubs, where they would quite gladly take on players to give them game time. Mm-hmm. Because it's so important, it's so important for these young players that's that's coming up and breaking through, and the seasoned pros when maybe they're coming back from from uh, maybe a, a slight injury or an injury that they're getting back in and they're playing. Game time gains experience. Yes, you've you've got years experience in your football gym. For me, personal point of view, as I used to love going to watch the reserve games, because the reserve, Hearts used to play in Stirling, so I would go and watch Celtic when they played Hearts, St Johnson played at the Rex in Alloa, so when Celtic were playing them, I would go along there, eh? and yeah. I've watched some development games, and for me the development games haven't got the same intensity no. as no. what the reserve games had. They, they, they have not and they, they, Maybe they, that's just a simple view of it. No, but, but, it's, a, but, but it's a, it's but a, it's a good a, view. It's a, it's a good view, it's an honest view. We grew up, we grew up that if Celtic was playing away, because you couldn't afford to go to the away games when we were younger, you would go down to Celtic Park on a Saturday afternoon and you would watch the reserves. So at that time, that would have been players like coming through for the for your book, Paul, Yeah, uh, which is the Quality Street Gang. That's right, yeah. And uh, I don't think we speak enough about uh, your book <laughs> and books. No, I don't. I think you know you've got a, a you've got those books out, and hopefully the viewers a, a, a go and look and read at these books, and with the knowledge that's uh, been put in there and the historical facts in there as well, um, the books that you, you've written. So today, Paul, before I come back on this, you've written uh, the Quality Street. A book. Yes. You've written the Neely Mocking book. You've written the Andy Lynch book. Mm-hmm. You're currently a waiting a finalisation for the Celtic Jersey book. That has consumed me for five years, Jim. Five yep. years, but that's okay. I'm, I'm going into retirement once that one's signed that's off. That's all right. And what's, is that it? There's a few others in the, in the pipeline. In the works. So, yeah. so that's good. <clears throat> so that brought me on to me think about the reserves. Me and a guy called Joyce, me and John Joyce, we go to Youth Cup, uh, uh, SYFA Youth Cup finals. We go to uh, 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 championship games, second division games, because it's, it's good to watch. And these players could fit in to these different uh, uh, teams 
and gain the experience. That way you're watching, you're seeing that they're developing, they're learning, they're learning how uh, to cope with coming away as well. Maybe the comfort that they've mm-hmm. got at a club. They come away and they play eh, with these other teams and they say, here, this is this is a real life. So they could come back better players knowing that they, they want to be even hungrier to get into the first team. It used to work in the past. Could it still work? I think I think it could. It's worked with I a lot of great Celtic players. Of even if you look at that team you've got at the moment, I know Tommy Rodgick's on his way out. We yeah. used a loan deal for Tommy Rodgick to get first team experience. Callum McGregor, Chris Sire, Ryan Christie. Uh, but Stephen Mullen wants to know, Jim, what's in Marty's memo today? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, by the way, it's a wee dig. It's, a, it's, a, it's know, an indirect know, free kick. I know. There's nothing in it today, and there was nothing in it yesterday. I didn't have any <laughs> memos for anybody. I love Stevie to death. He's a good guy, and he's actually he been very, very good for the show. He does a great job at St. Rock's. Before he came here, he was away he, yesterday. He was away to Rock Talk, making sure everybody was okay. He works hard. Nothing but compliments eh, for for Stephen. I defended eh, Neil Lennon. He's a Celtic manager. I read, I read, and I've looked, and I've thought, you know, Celtic gain hashtags, Lennon must go. Celtic fans, sorry, gain the hashtags, Lennon must go. And we've got to just stay. We've all got to try and get behind each other. And that's the message I was trying to put out mm-hmm. uh, yesterday, uh, Paul. I think he, if you were to look back in the tapes from yesterday, nobody criticised any individual. We we just tried to keep a, a complete harmony amongst ourselves going forward because we've got many, many people out there who would like to knock us at this particular time and take us off the track. But Stevie, I don't have any... Memos today. No newsletters. No newsletters. Listen, what you what you say there, Jim, just going back to what you said yeah. there about people are uh, looking to knock Celtic. I know that. I told you a wee story before we started yeah. today. Just uh, an experience I had of that this morning. People are really ready and willing to knock Celtic in this season of all seasons. And I think there was a lot of criticism, Kevin Graham, because I know you keep an eye on social media as well. There's a lot of criticism levied at a lot of the kind of Celtic outlets because it was almost as if, how dare you become part of this problem we have with the mainstream media and you're criticising the club. You've, there's a balance to be struck. So after the game against Ferenc Varos, Kevin, I came in for criticism for criticising Neil Lennon. There's a balance to be struck because you can't, always think everything's sweetness and light and come out and say that because that you then become part of a different problem and that different problem is you're walking about you with your eyes closed there's there's fans of other clubs in scotland who pretend everything's fine and dandy until it's too late and the club go bust yeah you know i'm not saying financially celtic are anywhere near a position like that you can't ignore what's in front of you by just continually putting videos together to say we are Celtic supporters, faithful through and through, and Lenny we trust, etc., etc. And I've seen it, and it, you know, something inside so strong, let's get the memes out every time we get beat and somebody's blaming Lennon. I find that preposterous. You've got to be able to take criticism on the chin. We're playing a sport where you're going to lose games. Yeah. And when that happens, somebody is going to get the blame for losing those games. And it doesn't mean that if your, your opinion is... Neil Lennon was at fault for us going out the Champions League. It doesn't mean that you don't support Neil Lennon. You're exactly. just pointing out a fact. We're like a big family. There's going to be... We're all dysfunctional going to, at times. We're dysfunctional, yeah. yes. We're, we're going to go home, at, at home tonight. And whether it's, uh, you're cooking the tea or something like that, your wife might say, you're not doing that right. It doesn't mean that she doesn't love you. She's just saying that you didn't, you're not cooking the tea right. Thanks for that, Kim. Uh, uh, thanks uh, for that wee stroke that of, was, of the ego. Thank you. Uh, that, that was... Uh, that but was quite good, actually. What you're saying there is right. At no point have I ever said Lennon no. out, sacked the board, no. sacked Neil Lennon. I've never said any of that. No, you haven't. You know, I've ha- criticised him because I thought his selection but was wrong but on Wednesday no, night. There's nothing wrong with, with, with criticism. It's constructive criticism. But I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Neil Lennon fan. Uh, I've always been a Neil Lennon fan, but I've had a lot of messages, you know, you're sticking the boot in. You know, we've got enough people doing that. 
as Jim says there, it was constructive criticism. Yeah. You weren't saying that he looks dishevelled. You weren't saying that the tracksuit doesn't That's fit right. him. You weren't saying I that. Never would. You, you, you were making a, a comment going, you, I think he put out the wrong team. You and, and Paul. That, that's constructive. You yeah. and Paul were speaking. And no disrespect to anybody that runs the media uh, organisations or media shows similar uh, to this over, over uh, podcasts. And we might be unique here going out. Uh, in a live stream. If people are just mentioning other other things to get clicks, to get this, whatever it's called uh, uh, these days, to get clicks, to get to get their viewing figures up, good luck to them. But what we have got here, what we have got here, we, 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 the, the team that that comes in and supports you here, Paul, uh, to guys like Kevin. Colin, Stephen, uh, and, and others, Lawrence, and other guys that's out there behind the scenes that, that people don't actually see at the moment. What they've got is passion. They speak with passion. They write with passion, and it means it means it means a lot. It means a lot to them. We didn't say any derogatory words uh, against anyone yesterday. Or previous before that, even after the game, we were disappointed. Neil, after the game, if you're in a game, if you're in a game, and you lose that game, your emotions are high. You come out and you say things, and you get it off your chest because you're disappointed. There's ways to do it. That's the only part we Neil the other night. Take care of business inside the dressing room and get it sorted and I think that was the majority uh, of uh, your thoughts run about here yesterday we spoke about all the different roles within Celtic not to criticise anybody individually to show everybody that we're going to have a togetherness as of now to move forward and sort any problems that's got to be sorted and that's what I think Neil and his team have done they sorted it yesterday. We've now got the platform of the three points and we bounce on for that. But you can criticise Neil Lennon, Paul. Kevin can criticise him. But we still back him, don't we? Always, always back. There you go. Definitely. I've always backed Neil Lennon. There's a lot of good um, messages coming through, actually. So we'll run through some yep. of these. Someone's suggesting that, in fact, there's a couple of comments on young Calvin Miller. Calvin Miller, who had been kind of... Root- Converted to left back, and I think he was freed there at the he end was. of last season. Um, he was up playing last week uh, with Plymouth against Rangers. It was a trialist, was he? It was a trialist, aye, in a close game uh, up at uh, Murray Park or uh, the Hummel w- Sports Direct or Hummel or uh, whatever, whatever it's called. Sorry, but I'm not being derogatory uh, against the, the, the sports complex because I've got friends who work uh, within. He, he different areas of uh, 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 football, mm-hmm. but he was up there and he done he done quite well. He done he, he, okay, he, yeah. he done he done very well. So uh, that's a disappointment, isn't it? That that's no worked out because as a youth player, he done exceptionally well. Maybe he lost his way a wee bit. That's, that does Ma- happen. Maybe he it? lost his way a wee bit and he's coming back in. Mm-hmm. He's coming back in he, he the fold. But there's other other things that he can work on. Just another wee thing I was going to say, but, you know, my final point on the reserve, the reserve league yeah. as well, Jim. The other, the other area that that we could work on, and I mentioned before that there was definitely talks between Celtic and Dunfermline about a partnership whereby we farmed out, you know, going back to the old farming out of players. I think it was five players at any given time to Dunfermline. You're right. So there was a, there was a, a not a deal, but there was there was. Discussions ongoing a couple of seasons ago, where we would give them five young players who who would then be part of the first team squad. But I think when I was speaking to Graham Diamond about this, and Graham's obviously the sporting director at Clyde yeah. FC, he said that's all fair and well. So you're getting the young guys at Celtic a game, 
but then Dunfermline are not buying the five players they would have normally bought that mm-hmm. season. So then what's happening is the young guys from maybe the bigger clubs are maybe edging some of the other players mm. out of the game. Where do mm. they go? I think mm. that's what Graham Diamond's point was. So, right. you know, let's say you had five teams with deals like that. 25 young guys going to the, lo- the lower leagues. Where does the 25 players go that they would have signed had they not had this this uh, influx of young guys? And I think that was the, the issue that maybe some of the the um, smaller, more provincial clubs had. What happens to the 25, 30 players who would have had a club? It's a domino effect, isn't it? Yes. It's a complete domino effect. And, and Graham Diamond, he, who, who I've worked with, Graham's a, an excellent coach. He's obviously director of football uh, at Clyde uh, and, and, and brilliant for him. But G- Graham's a guy that he, that uh, he, he's good to have round because you, you can learn you can learn from him. His knowledge, his knowledge uh, is good. His his involvement with you is good. His 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 absolute uh, way of thinking. Uh, is to give and hopefully give younger players the opportunity to come through and break through into into first first team. So I understand what he's saying. If you give five players here, five players there, or where do you get the young players today to slot right into a team without the pre the, without the manager? having the pressure on them to win games Mm -hmm. because it's a livelihood for the managers of these lower division uh, clubs. So is he really going to take the chance on the younger players to lose his job or does he want to bring in and say uh, Celtic, Aberdeen, Rangers or Hibs or Hearts, there's these players in more experienced than what I've got. Unfortunately, he's going to take in the more experienced players because it helps save him his job. No, you're right. And, and play it safe. Play it and, safe. And play it safe. So it's a difficult situation, isn't it? Um, and how to introduce these young guys yeah. into the team. But I'd like to get Graham back in again, eh, Paul, uh, and, and have another wee talk on uh, uh, various things on the football front with him. Oh, he's always welcome, isn't yeah. he, Graham? Um, he was a great, he was a great guest when he came in. But I think there there is a, a difficulty, and and now we're just taking it for granted. If you ever need a player, you just go and buy a player. You know, in the yeah. past, you would have had this conveyor belt of youth players coming through, wouldn't you? You'd be looking at for me, who's yeah. next in line at left back, who's next in line at right back. For me, you should always look within first. If you're looking for any yeah. solutions, you should always look at within first. But for, the, for me, yeah, yeah you're right, eh, Kev. You're, you're, you're right, but if they're looking at and there's nothing looking within and there's nothing there, if that that's right, if they're no, not ready, because I think it will basically be a case. And Jim, you've had experience within a club of the first team manager going to let's say the head of development and saying, right, who you got ready for me? First team ready? Who you got that I can put in that yeah. first team? And if that answer is none, nobody at the moment, Neil, or it might take six months before X, Y, or Z are ready. Neil goes back because he's back at the drawing board because right. nobody's ready, and I know Martin O'Neill approached it like that as well. That's how we, that's how we done it. But there, but, there, as but long as that question gets asked, it does get asked. It really does get asked. I mean, you you look at the the coaches there at Celtic, the youth coaches as well under Chris McCart. They they're looking at all the players that they have got, and they're working tirelessly to say who can we put forward. Who can we? Who do we think we can put in there? And and he's he's going to be he's going to be fine. They would go to Neil Lennon and say, "We think this player here, Neil Lennon, would go. I don't think he's he's ready yet." So they all talk about it. And that's what I'm talking about. The team, mm-hmm. the whole team, everybody's involved. You're right. Look within to see what you've got within your whole your whole squad. Not just everything within the club. But there's nothing there at the moment, is there? It takes me back to I the point think. I keep bringing up, Jim. Where's our goal scoring striker coming through the ranks? We used to produce them for fun, you know, right back to the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, right into the 80s with Charlie. Where's our next golden kid coming through who scores goals? And we've got Henrik Larson, who's going to be the striker coach at Barca. I tipped him for the strikers coach at Celtic. Nobody listened to me. Obviously, Lenny doesn't listen to the show. Aye, but. 
If you, you, all it would have taken was a wee text message and, and Harson would have, you, you know, Larson, I said Harson, that was a wee <laughs> throw you on the slip. Aye. I've had that discussion with Big John, but um, he, would have, he would have walked over broken glass to come back. Of course. He, he, so Celtic's loss is Barcelona's gain? He, I think so. You know, I, I think so. I think he, Henrik Larson will do a fantastic job there. He working working with the strikers, but we have got to look at developing strikers, strikers, and strikers. Yeah, and again, a, a big part of that going back to what Kevin said, you actually knew you knew underneath that first team who the next group of players were that were coming through when you had that reserve league. Yeah, it's a wee bit more kind of fractured now, isn't it? With, with such a lack of games getting played with the development players. There's a few comments coming in, uh, name checking Jack Aitchison, almost a, a, a blast from the past. You know, he's a young kid, but you know he made his debut at 16 years of age, scored in his debut. Am I right in saying it was in Dyla's last game against Motherwell? Seven, was it seven I, nil seven, game. Seven, seven nil. Uh, Where is Tierney he now? Is that. he still at the club? Or, or? He's still at the club. Um, he went down to Forest Green For Rovers, Rovers or Rangers uh, Rovers yeah. last season. Scored a few, and then uh, you know I don't know if they, they moved in position at that stage. He looked to be a goal scorer, but he's not anywhere near the first team squad. He's not he? anywhere near the first team squad, and he hasn't. We don't know if he. He probably needs to go out on loan again. But he's, he's not a name that's been mentioned about going out on loan. Gary Doonan, who obviously has got uh, a great knowledge of what's happening around about the Celtic youth team, um, is saying that Cameron Harper and Adam Brooks are your two strikers for that level. Cameron Harper's American, though. Am I right when saying Maybe. that? So, is it another... Maybe no Scottish. Or, or, or we, we just want to bring through a striker. That's no, but I mean, he would still cla- he would still class as being a homegrown, even though we've maybe got him young and brought him uh-huh. over. You know, he'd still be a homegrown because uh, some people do mention Tony Watt, but we bought Tony Watt from Airdrie, didn't we? Yeah. And to be fair, it's you, you couldn't class Tony as a prolific goal scorer for Celtic. No. You know, if you look at the, the games and, and the goals that he scored, um, and you know, people are mentioning as well, Karim Dembele is a is a youth player. I think he's not he's not a striker, does he? He's not an out and out striker. And obviously he's a name that's been mentioned in the podcast over the last couple of weeks as potentially having asked for a transfer from the club. Um, so that, I would, I've would i got to say, I, I maybe I was a wee bit blunt last week, I would be disappointed if that young kid left Celtic. Because Why? I think we've dedicated a lot of time, a lot of years into his development. And you want to see an end product. I was, mm-hmm. I was disappointed... Um, in Islam Farouz I was disappointed in you know the late Liam Miller because you know the, the, fact, the fact was Celtic had spent a lot of time in his development and I wanted to see the finished article in the hoops and we got a glimpse at William Miller didn't we and then he went down to Manchester United I, I would be more disappointed if Dembele left if not done a Liam Muller, but if he had been, if he had a good season with Celtic, then left, mm-hmm. then if thought maybe given us a couple of years. But the fact that he's he's had fleeting first team appearances, he's seventeen year old. We can still see flaws in his game. Yeah. I'm going if he's got an agent that's telling him he's better off elsewhere. Then let him go. Comes down to the strength of the player eventually, and it's difficult when you're seventeen. Definitely. And obviously, Farouz was even younger. I think when he got his new agent. You know, Calhoun to the new agent. Um, it's difficult because they are they're they've dangling that carrot of English Premiership wages, aren't they? And it's difficult for the kids, but it can effectively ruin them. Ooh. Not everybody is a Billy Gilmer in that scenario. He, he's class. Nah, he's class, and he, and he's he's developing brilliantly. But a lot more of them end up on the scrap piece. Glas- Glasgow Cup final. Glasgow Cup final. He was outstanding. He was absolutely outstanding. He was outstanding in that game and he went away. But what the difference is with, with young Gilmer, he's towed the line and he wants to play football and he is working hard at his game down south. You look at uh, young Dembele. Who would you take it to put him in? No no one. He, so Frimpong's ahead of him and he's uh, the second choice right. for me in that area of the field. So his agent's upset. He's upset because he's not getting the game. But does that make him an individual as a young player? Or does that make him a team player with saying, you know what, I want to be part of this. I need to work harder to get in this team. 
Can I see myself getting into this team? The answer's no. So, do you think with him going down south, Karamoko, Dembele, going down south, that he's going to be guaranteed first-team football? No. Personally, no. I don't think so. He's no. going back into a development squad. Of course squad. he is. He's going if, if he's going squad. to a, so, if, he, if, he's going to a, if he's going to a Man City or Chelsea, or if he fancies going to Germany, like a couple of his teammates have done, he's going into their development squads. Absolutely. He's, he's nowhere near a first team squad. Who, who no. would you, at the top of your head, no, my elevator question, Paul, I don't want you playing that music, but who would you take out the note to put? Dembele, any? I, I wouldn't take anyone. Nipty. I wouldn't take anyone so, to give him a game. So we upset all the Celtic fans by putting him in to keep him happy, or do we keep everybody happy by playing playing the team, eh, the, the five that we've got at the moment across the midfield? Dembele, Dembele, if he doesn't want to be there uh, as a young lad, he's he, he's got to seriously think what he's doing. Let me let me try and take it from a different angle then. You're Den Belly, you're seventeen, you've been lauded for years and years as the next big thing at Celtic Park, right? The club have put in a lot of the, the yards for him. That's Absolutely right. no doubt about it. But he's not playing any games, Jim. So he's not playing for the first team, which means he's not playing. Because yeah. he's not going to be playing your thirteen development games, I think it is, correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, that Celtic played last year. Yeah. He's maybe at the stage at seventeen where he sees that as a, a backward step. If he was to go and play in a development... And you know what? It might be a backward step for his development if he was to go and play with other kids at 17. So I, I think it's actually a very... It's a very difficult situation to be in for Neil Lennon. It does, it's not helped when the agents start to then f- infiltrate the thought process of young Dembele and say, you should be doing this, you should be earning that. Because he isn't ready for the first team. You're, you're absolutely spot no. on. He sat on the bench against Hearts Cup final. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He's, he sat on the bench, didn't he? He was on the bench that day. Mm-hmm. So it's not as if he's not part of the plans. He's there or thereabouts. And you maybe should say to him, you'll be happy with eight, nine, ten first team appearances this season. But obviously, he's he's had his head turned. But from his development perspective, it's not ideal to have to play no games, uh, isn't he? But earlier on in the show, and I think today's show is a show where we've got a difference. It's uh, it's nice and uh, relaxed and talking here. Last week. Was uh, was a a complete and utter week. Uh, it was Celtic news that. Uh, uh, but yesterday calmed everybody down a wee bit. But you you look at him, you 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 look at him, and at the beginning of the show, we said that players must get game time. He's included in that. He's included in that. But what's to stop us for saying, is he in the 16? The 16? If he's not, let's get him game time somewhere else. But that, Manchester that again, City, he's scared to do it. Well, if he was to go to one of these clubs like Kevin mentioned, let's say, for example, Bayern Munich, who are keeping a close eye yeah. on developments in Scottish academies, etc. Mm-hmm. What they might do is just play him in academy games, the B team. You know, like Ryan Gold when he goes to Sport in Lisbon, he's immediately in the B team at that point. Yeah. Or they might loan him out. So what's the harm in Celtic loaning him out and keeping him there's and being harm. the parent club for Dembele? There's Should he develop the way everybody harm, they, they, they will be putting games on anyway, Paul. They, he'll, he'll be getting a uh, game time. Granted, they're, no, they're non-competitive games, but he'll still be playing in games, as will others be in, in there. One of the examples is Martin Orgard who was linked with us yeah. when Ronnie Dial was there, ended up going to Real Madrid. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he's played in the Dutch league. Yeah. I'm sure he's played he's also played in the Spanish league as well. Yeah. But he's still a Real Madrid player, but how far away is he away from getting into that Real Madrid side? I think he's played for Real Madrid, isn't he? The first team. He has played I'm, one I'm game. I'm hundred percent sure. But I just know that wherever he's went on loan, he's actually shown on loan. Going and back. actually Manchester City looked to take him on loan. Yeah, it's going back to what Jim says though, if you've got a relationship with a club where you know that the philosophy and the culture of that club suits the way that Celtic think, you could put a player over there and trust that he's going to obviously get the development me, that he, he requires. T- to circle off the Dembele situation, I would be looking to send them on loan, but I'd be looking to send them on loan to a, to a league in Europe. Yeah, get him, get him out of the Scottish league. Anyway. You Scottish. didn't want him to disappear into no. the third tier of English football. No. 
I'll, like, I'll, I'll know, look to the Dutch Manchester or like City. That. Manchester City have been a good partner with Celtic. Would you agree? I think they've done well out of that uh relationship or that arrangement. So, but they're confident. They're confident in getting players up to Celtic. So hopefully that puts to bed all these different things that people are putting out that, oh, individual trainers here, individual this. Celtic, they're sending players up. A a team like Manchester City, an organisation like Manchester City wouldn't be sending these players up over the years. They've got faith in sending them into Celtic to help them progress as players. So, So we've got to have faith as well in putting players out. Sorry, my question, that wasn't my question to you, that just came into my head. What players in the current team just now went out and loan and came back better players? McGregor. Yep. Ayer. Yep. And Christie. Yep. And arguably Tom Rogic. Because we, yeah. we did send them out and loan to get games and they come back. Have they come back better with the experience? I yes. think they did, yeah. And, so. and interestingly enough, Ayer and Christie uh, got that experience in Scottish football. Yes. One at Kilmarnock, one at Aberdeen. Right. So just by playing the games, and I mean, when you look at them now, they are two, for me, they're still two first picks mm-hmm. in the team. And they gained that experience within our own league. Mm-hmm. But I take your point, Kevin. I don't think that's the move for Dembele. No, I don't think so either. Um, interestingly enough, uh, from Facebook, we're getting that uh, Odegaard did get ship- shipped out to Real Sociedad, Kevin. Mm-hmm. But Zidane's called him back for this season. Wow. So Excellent. Two loan moves, two successful loan yeah. moves, and now he's in the Real Madrid first. Yeah. first there was squad. even rumours that he might end up at Celtic Park because of the Ronnie Dyla connection, mm-hmm. wasn't there? Aye. Making his debut for, um, what was the name of the team again? Strom's God set. I thought he was 16. 15. 15. He yeah. was 15, eh? You know, Paul, we're, we're talking about all these uh, different subjects here. We've still got a quadruple to go for from last season. We've got the, the still got the Scottish Cup quadruple to go for. Quadruple treble. Yeah, we've still got that to go for. And once he, he, we we get that a Cup game out the way as well and, and, and progress and uh, it'll be interesting We've still got a very, very interesting and a great season ahead of us, haven't we? We're still going for our and fourth and fifth trebles in a row. We're going for our fourth and fifth trebles in a row. That That is astonishing, Kevin. Mm. Um, so the fifth one's a quin... A quintuple. A quintuple. Oh, a quintuple. A quintuple. A quintuple. Anyway. Quintuplets are... Uh, that's five kids. Eh? Let's look at the quadruple first. The quadruple treble. Um, and again, I think I made the point that... Uh, had it not been for a really bad decision against Inverness, Carly Thistle would have been going for, what would it be, seven and eight years? Seven and eight years, right? Anyway, um, it's been an absolute fascinating insight into the worlds of Celtic via the YouTube, Facebook and Twitter users, as well as Jim Simonetti and Kevin Graham. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and also get subscribing on YouTube. And we should be back to speak to you tomorrow again. We also look at some non-Celtic content, believe it or not. We've got a very special guest tomorrow who uh, will be well known. He's a Scottish football managerial legend. He's a poet, Kevin, and he's an MBE, uh, which I might ask him about. Um, But he will be on A State of Mind tomorrow as well. And we will be also recording episode two of the Salt and Sauce show on Wednesday with a very special guest. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, But until then, thank you all for joining us on A Celtic State of Mind. Thank you. Thank you.